So if you've seen my MCMC tutorials on video lectures, then uh, you might not get so much new from this. But I've tried to rejig it to sort of be relevant to this meeting and, and deep learning. If you don't know much about Monte Carlo or MCMC, then this first talk is for you. I'm going to give a very basic introduction to Monte Carlo and uh, things like Gibbs sampling. If you're lost at any point, you get, this talk is for you. You should stop me. Um, I'm probably not going to get on to the auxiliary variable methods before the break, so I'm going to continue this talk after the break and tell you about um, hybrid Monte Carlo, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and advanced things. So um, I was uh, looking on the internet to see what was going on at this meeting before I, I got here, and uh, this was uh, something I saw one of you guys wrote on Google+, Plus, like summarizing uh, the feeling from some of the talks in the first week. So uh, uh, you've heard a lot about sparse modeling, and uh, not everybody in this community um, values using probabilistic models and probabilistic framework. And really, there's no point using Monte Carlo methods unless you're using probabilistic modeling. So I don't want to like start a fight, but I'm going to, in both of my talks, give a little bit of sort of motivation of why I find it useful to look at probabilities. And this is some a con conversation we can continue in the breaks and at the panel discussion. OK. So there's a really basic reason I like probabilistic models, and that's that I can draw fantasies from the model and see what the model believes about data. So that lets me understand the models. We can also use it as part of our learning. And also, it's a way of communicating high dimensional objects to people. It's very hard to summarize um, a distribution over high dimensional objects, but if you've got samples, you can give those samples to people or to another model, and that's a compact summary of the sorts of things that model believes. So if you get any sort of um, responsible Bayesian modeling paper, and I've just plucked a random paper, this is a, was in UAI in 2005, you'll often see samples drawn from the model. And this is a robot mapping problem. It doesn't really matter what it is. They've got sonar data in the bottom left. Um, and what they've done in the top is drawn priors from their models. So they said, we've got this model of what we think rooms might look like before we get data. And this is typical samples of what we think rooms might look like. And you can see that no real building looks like that. And so in the posterior, they get all sorts of jaggedy artifacts as a result of that. And so you can understand what's going on. You could go in and maybe try and come up with a better prior over, over rooms. Um, so in the deep learning community, there's a lot of this going on. You've seen in Marco Aurelio's talks that people regularly draw samples from natural image patches and patches of natural images from models. And they can do this criticism of saying, are we doing a good job? Are our models fitting? And so these figures have been in previous talks from um, work quite a few years ago. And uh, these are real natural image patches. And uh, these ones were drawn from this model that was state of the art four years ago. And if you look closely, you can see problems. And if you make them bigger, you can see problems. Marco Aurelio has been fixing up some of those problems. But you know, if you look at his patches and they're big enough, they still suck to some extent. right? You know, there's still a lot of work to do, which is a good thing, because otherwise we'd all go home. Um, I find that useful. So drawing fantasy is really useful for human learning, because from a few examples, we're really good at coming up with really rich hypotheses about what might help and uh, what's going on. Um, but you know, we're interested in doing machine learning, too. So here's an example of using um, fantasy data to help machine learning. Um, most of you have probably seen the Microsoft Connect. It's this uh, camera that you can attach to an Xbox, and it will um, it can see depth. that has a special camera that sees depth, so it can see people like this, the gray figures. And um, one of the things that the Kinect wants to do is understand the pose of people so that you can use your whole body as a controller in a game. So they needed to write code that would actually solve that task, that for arbitrary people, for me, and for some enormous fat guy and for a toddler would work, and it would work even if I was wearing baggy clothing or a swimsuit. Um, and this isn't you know, the hardest task in the world, but if you want a robust system that you can ship in a games console and actually work, then I think that's a challenge. Um, and in some ways, it's a fairly standard machine learning problem. You get a whole load of training data of depth maps and labels, and you know, you're basically learning a classifier with, with some structure. But the question is, where do you get all that data from? So you could imagine sort of paying 100 volunteers to stand in front of a Kinect and 
Um, and it would take quite a long time. And then you're not going to span the whole space of different poses of people. And then you're going to get all your volunteers to dress up in all sorts of different clothes. And then you're going to label all of those images. It's a nightmare. So what they actually did was all of the images on the left aren't real data. They're generated from a model of human pose and so completely synthetic. And then they can get as much data as they want of as many different types of people as they want. And then it doesn't really, when you've got infinite data, it doesn't really matter what you use to fit it. So they used random forests. They could have used other things, I'm sure, and it would, would work. Um, so generating data is useful. If you really want to train some part of a system and, and nail it down, you can get as much data as you want. And I think the interesting future direction is how to make this thing deep. If you're wanting to learn something that's much less constrained than this connect problem, how do you sort of go in and uh, learn separately about pose and lighting and stuff by generating the right data? And this is an open issue that I know people at Microsoft are thinking about. OK, so we've seen a lot of vision. So I wanted to give you one other example of sort of the type of probabilistic modeling that I'm excited about. This is a graphical model that was made by Rob Fergus, who gave a talk at this meeting. And it's from a grant application that he made with David Hogg, a um, collaborator of his at NYU. David Hogg is an astronomer. So this is a model of the stuff in this node at the bottom. They're pixels which have been observed in telescopes. And a lot of stuff went into deciding what hit the CCD. The orientation of the telescope, a whole load of calibration stuff, um, what's actually in the sky, the stars and the galaxies, and we have a whole load of detailed models of where those things came from. So I don't think we can really deny that this thing is a pretty deep model of pixels in these images. And this is a model that we've genuinely learned from just seeing photons come to us on Earth or very close to Earth. Um, and we've constructed this whole thing. So some human learning has gone on here. And we've done this very impressive task. And we're not at the stage where we could throw all of these pixels into a generic learning system and it would reproduce this thing unsupervised. But that doesn't mean that deep learning and feature learning isn't useful to these guys. If you want to fit parts of this model, you have a pretty hairy data pipeline. And neural networks are for sure useful in bits of that pipeline. But these guys are in this grant application, they're wanting to be pretty Bayesian about the whole thing. So if you're a scientist, you don't want to just sort of fit something. You really want to say responsibly what you can and cannot infer from your data, how sure you are about things. You want to do model comparison of theories. And I think if you guys want to sell a neural network to people like this, then it really needs to be outputting probabilities. And you need to be able to calibrate those. OK. So that's my uh, uh, spiel about why I like probabilities. We can argue about that later. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is just draw samples from models and look at them, So, like for the connect problem. Um, so I'm going to start with that. And then I'm going to uh, later on get on to fancy methods that we'll need if we're dealing with things like Boltzmann machines. So um, if you've got a model of a pose that says you first put your shoulder somewhere and then you arrange the joints according to some distributions, then it's usually pretty easy to just simulate from a, a feed-forward model like that. Um, here's a book that's online that tells you how to sample from all sorts of standard probability distributions. It's a very nice book, um, but the reality is that most of you guys will never need to read it because all of the stuff in books like this have been implemented in SciPy and other libraries you use. So if you want to sample from some probability distribution, you just call a library routine and it will do it. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about how some of those library routines work, because we'll need to understand it. So if you've got um, a real number and some distribution over that real number, then um, as most of you will already know, a way to sample from that distribution is to draw points uniformly at random in the area, the white area underneath the blue curve. And then once you've got those points, you just read off the location, and those are the samples. So this is sort of obviously correct, because the probability of being in some little region is proportional to the height. Um, so how do you draw points uniformly under, an, under a curve when the curve's complicated and you don't know how to do it analytically? There's this thing called rejection sampling, where you get some other distribution in red that you do know how to sample from. And you scale it up so that it's always above the distribution that you want to sample from. So if you've got a simple distribution you know how to sample from, you can sample 
lots of points uniformly in the area underneath the red curve. You then just throw away all of the points that don't happen to lie underneath the blue curve. And what's left, the black dots, those are uniformly drawn under the blue curve. You can read off your locations and you've got samples. So rejection sampling, whether you know it or not, you've used because the I didn't really believe this when I first saw it, but the best, the fastest way to draw from your Gaussian distribution is a very specialized rejection sampler, and that's what MATLAB uses. So if you've ever called RANDEN in MATLAB, you, you've been doing rejection sampling. Okay, so once you've got your samples, however you've done it, um, you might just be looking at them and saying, oh, aren't they pretty? Uh, but often the reason we're doing Monte Carlo is to compute integrals. So uh, you've got a rich object X, which could be the pose of a person, or it could be an image or something. And if you're interested in some function of that object, f, then you might be interested in integrals involving that function. So for example, what I've drawn on the slide is, if for some reason I was interested in the length between my left thumb and my nose, and I wanted to know what's that average distance, so that's just some statistic I could measure from my model, which I could see if that fits well or something, then uh, the average distance between my nose and my left thumb is this integral. It's an expectation. and if you wanted to solve that integral numerically, it would be a bit of a pain. X the, is a vector describing my whole pose. That's a lot of numbers. And if you wanted to grid up that space and use quadrature to solve that integral, um, it wouldn't scale well. It would use a lot of computer time. Um, and for high dimensional problems in pose, it would definitely be impossible. But by Monte Carlo, this integral is easy. All you do is draw a bunch of random poses, maybe 100. Uh, you look empirically in those 100 samples how far was my thumb from my nose, and you find the average. So this simple Monte Carlo procedure is unbiased. It's clear that if I draw a bunch of samples, I'll get a pretty good estimate of this thing quite quickly. This function is bounded because it's only so far I can stretch my thumb away from my nose. Um, and the variance of the estimate falls with the number of samples. So for this sort of problem, Monte Carlo is like a, a really obvious way to go. There's one other neat thing about Monte Carlo, which I'm going to have, it, this seems kind of obvious, but I'm going to mention it a couple of times, so I'm going to go through it slowly. This function, my thumb from my nose, is actually a function of only a small part of the pose. It doesn't matter where my legs are. It doesn't change the distance between my thumb and my nose. So the integral I'm interested in is this integral over a subset of the variables that are actually relevant to the function. So if I was doing numerical integration, this would make things easier because it's now a lower dimensional integral except that we don't necessarily know the marginal probability, the probability of a subset of the variables. So if you look at the whole literature on approximate inference, it's all about if you've got a model, how do we compute marginals? Because that's a really hard task. So marginalization is often seen as difficult, but in the Monte Carlo world, it's a non-issue. Um, what you do is you just sample from the whole pose anyway, even though you don't need to, and then you just throw away the variables you don't need. So, Marginalization in Monte Carlo is throwing variables away. And um, in any other world, a deterministic inference, it's a hard thing to do. Right. So, so this is the standard Monte Carlo setup. And it's nice if you know how to sample from the model. So if I'm interested in um, properties of a simple feedforward model, I know I can just sample from P. If I can't do that, I need to do a trick called important sampling. I've got this integral I'm interested in, and I can't sample from p. So what I do is I rewrite it as an integral involving a different distribution, q. So q could be something like a Gaussian, something standard I can sample from. And I've divided and multiplied by q. So I've just multiplied by 1. And as long as I didn't divide by 0 here, this is something I can always do. Okay. So once I've rewritten the integral, this is an identity then this is just an expectation under Q. So this is something I can apply Monte Carlo to. I could draw samples from Q, and, I've, and I got to pick Q, so I can definitely do that. Um, and then I've got the standard Monte Carlo estimate. And I now, instead of um, uh, computing the average values of my functions, I've weighted them by how important they are. So if Q is much larger than P in rejection sampling, I reject the sample. Here, I just downweight it. That sample is less important because I'm oversampling it. Q is putting too much mass there. So naively, uh, important sampling looks as if it solves all our problems, because you can do this to any integral. In fact, if you look at these equations, 
there doesn't really need to be a distribution p there at all. I could do this to any integral. I could just multiply and divide by q and turn it into an expectation. This estimate looks is unbiased, and you know it has the same property that as I draw more samples, the error bars will get tighter. Um, so it's, it looks good. If you were to sit down and implement it, you'll hit a couple of problems immediately. One of them is that you might not be able to evaluate p here, so you might not be able to compute this equation. So if you've got something like a Boltzmann machine or the posterior and a Bayesian inference problem, you only know this thing up to a constant. Um, and so then you don't actually know how to compute that equation. So there's a version of important sampling that uh, can deal with unnormalized distribution. So you say, I know what P star is, but I don't know what the Z is that would turn that into a distribution. And in the what's now looking messy equation for important sampling, I've pulled out the normalizing constants. You approximate those separately using the same samples that you drew. Um, and it turns out that when you go through the math, it, you get the unnormalized weights that just ignore the normalizing constant you don't know. You normalize them, you make them add up to one, and then and everything drops out. So you get an estimator which is consistent. When you draw enough samples, you get the right answer. So I don't want to go through this line by line, because that's no fun. But if you haven't seen important sampling before, your homework exercise, which I really strongly recommend you do, is prove that a good, an estimator of the normalizing constant ZP is just the average of the importance weights that you get. If you can prove this fact at the bottom of the slide, you'll know everything there is to know about simple importance sampling. So if you haven't seen it before, do do that. And if you can't do it, send me an email. OK, so simple Monte Carlo setup's nice, and if we can't sample from P, we can just rewrite it so that we can sample from Q. But when we turn to things like Boltzmann machines, it's not obvious how to proceed. So there is a rejection sampling algorithm for RBMs, and it was explained in um, Jeff's 2000-2002 paper on products of experts. So if you haven't read that paper, Training Products of Experts by Contrastive Divergence, I highly recommend it. It's very readable. It actually had this idea of stacking Boltzmann machines in it back in the tech report in 2000. Um, and there's some code on my website to reproduce figure two from that paper, which I also recommend you go through. OK, so back to sampling. Um, the rejection sampling algorithm for RBMs is you've got a product of experts. Each hidden unit is an expert, which is a mixture between two um, Bernoulli distributions. And there's an expert for the visible biases. So the mixture is between a uniform distribution and a specialized distribution. So this is an expert from a hidden unit. It decided to draw a uniformly drawn image, so that's random noise. This expert decided to draw an image from its specialized distribution, so that's something blobby. Um, this is some other specialized distribution, and then these experts drew uniform distributions. The rejection sampling algorithm is, if you do this procedure of drawing a bunch of images for each expert, if they happen to be identical, then you can accept that image as a, a draw from the model. Um, and that doesn't happen very often. Uh, you're going to wait quite a long time before all of those images are coincidentally a nice hand-drawn four. Um, this was trained on MNIST. Uh, so it's, an, it's a nice idea, and it does help with the description of the paper, but it's very hard to come up with a rejection sampling algorithm that actually ever accepts for high-dimensional images. Um, and uh, here's a little toy example that begins to explain what your problems in high dimensions are. So if you've got any, this is now real valued, if you've got um, a distribution you're interested in which is Gaussian or close to Gaussian, and you want to, you can't sample from this directly, so you want to use a proxy for it, Q, which in this example is another Gaussian with a different width, then you could ask, how well would important sampling work? How well would rejection sampling work if instead of sampling from P, I sample from Q? And it turns out that Rejection sampling, the acceptance rate uh, disappears exponentially quickly with dimension. So rejection sampling just doesn't work in high dimensions unless P and Q are basically exactly the same. And important sampling, uh, the, you don't reject any samples, but you do reweight them with this important sampling ratio. And in this example, the variance of the important sampling weights blows up exponentially with dimensionality. Um, and it's possible, if you do things wrong, to even get infinite variance. So um, again, if you have things that are even close to Gaussian, these simple distributions, unless your approximation Q is basically exactly right, which is never going to happen, um, 
these algorithms blow up. Um, as an aside, when I first made this slide, you know, I did some quick calculus on the back of an envelope to work out this expression. The, the details of this expression don't matter, it's just <laughs> this blow up. But if you're preparing slides for a talk, it's kind of embarrassing if your equations are wrong. Um, and the first time I gave the talk, I just had to fess up and say this might be wrong. Um, and then the second time I gave the talk, I had the sense to actually check this expression using Monte Carlo. And so I'm pretty sure this is right. So this is a, another thing, just whatever you're doing, if you're doing maths, you can often check it with Monte Carlo and you'd be stupid not to. Um, even though it took me a couple of times to giving these talks to remember. Okay, so I wanna give you one more insight into important sampling. This importance weight, remember, is an estimate of the normalizing constant of P. That's your homework problem to, to work out why that's true. Um, so often people say, well, the invariance of an important sampler can be infinite or high, and so you really can't say anything about the normalizing constant. And that's not really true. So let's look at what happens. We've got a distribution over the importance weight. So this is a random algorithm. Every time I draw a sample from Q, I get a new importance weight. And so these importance weights have some distribution. And the lowest an importance weight can be is zero. They're positive quantities because they're ratios of probabilities. Um, and so these distributions are often skewed when you have a firm lower bound and it changes the shape of the distribution. It's not going to look Gaussian. And so the mean of this distribution is often skewed off to the right from the peak. But this mean of this distribution is the normalizing constant. So I'm wanting to estimate the location of this red line. And when I draw importance weights, which are these magenta crosses, um, they'll be scattered around. And on average, their position will tend to the true answer, the mean. So this is the nice situation of important sampling where you're looking for the average value of importance weights that tell you what a normalizing constant is. Now. The problem is that this distribution goes out to infinity. The importance weights in many problems are potentially unbounded. And if I just add a little bit of mass to the tail of this distribution, I can actually put this red bar, the mean of the distribution, wherever I like. So we could have the situation on the bottom. And you know, this is, my, this is plotted in MATLAB. This is a real distribution, and this is where the mean is. Uh, it just carries on out to infinity. Um, so if you have a problem with this situation, where your importance weights have some mass, which is there's some probability that the weight is very large, then what will happen 99.999% of the time is all your samples will be in the bulk of the distribution, and they'll all be lower than the value you're trying to estimate. So this is officially an unbiased estimator. Um, the average value of those purple crosses does tend to this red line, and it happens because very occasionally you'll get a sample that's over here somewhere. Um, but 99.999% of the time, you are going to underestimate the normalizing constant. So saying that important sampling is unbiased is kind of meaningless often. If you're estimating normalizing constants, you're going to underestimate. And if you've got a whole bunch of different important sampling estimators that give you vastly different numbers, you usually just want to go with the biggest one. OK. So that's all there is to simple Monte Carlo, really. The, this idea that we want to draw samples and they're useful to look at and to compute averages, and we can shoehorn Monte Carlo into any integral by doing important sampling. Um, and there haven't been any questions that I've seen, but do stop me if that's not clear. Um, so we've seen that this simple idea isn't going to work for Boltzmann machines, and it's not going to work for high dimensional distributions unless we know how to decompose them into lots of low dimensional distributions. So that's what we need this thing MCMC for, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So here's the rules of the game. We're going to have a distribution on X, which is going to be some rich high dimensional object like an image. And we're going to know the energy or the log probability up to a constant. So we know this thing, but we don't know the normalizing constant. Maybe we, well, we're going to talk in the next lecture about how we could estimate z offline, but it's not something that uh, we can use within the inner loop of an algorithm. And we want to draw fantasy images from, from this model. And uh, so as a running example, this, we could be drawing an object like this, an image patch, and we could have a model that says that we prefer images where things look smooth. And the reason that rejection sampling and important sampling are dumb is that they will throw down random images and say, 
does this random image look good? And a lot of the time, they'll have images that will upset this model. And eventually, you might find an image like this that's good. But then you just carry on generating random junk again. And anyone sensible would have said, oh, I found a good image. Maybe I should have sort of tried to learn from that and use something about the good image I eventually found to sort of work out what good samples look like. So an idea is that once you've got an image from the sort of a reasonable um, candidate under your model, you could look at lots of little local perturbations of that image, and maybe a bunch of those are going to be plausible under the model too. So you could construct some queue which now doesn't draw independent images, but is conditioned on a known good image, and that generates new images x prime. And so that's an idea. This distribution might be useful. But you can't use this inside important sampling. So this distribution puts a load of mass on some good images, but it also puts very low mass on a lot of other good images. So there are images which are good under the model, but a long way away from this one we found. Um, and if you have keys that put low probability on good images, then you're, you're going to get very high variance. So we need another idea. And the other idea is Markov chain Monte Carlo. So now in, uh, what we're going to do is construct a random walk or a Markov chain where we start with an image and we change it slightly to get another image, we change that slightly to get another image, we keep going. And after many steps, you might have um, moved quite a long way. You'll get a different, very different looking image, but it was through tiny changes. Um, so you didn't have to understand a lot about what the model likes. You just needed to make small enough changes that there was some chance of finding good ones. And this process is the Markov chain because it's defined by a transition operator where the way you generate an image at time t only depends on the image at the previous step. That's what Markov means. And the property that we're looking for, the goal of this algorithm, is that if we simulate this chain for a long time, I haven't said how we're going to do this yet, if we run this chain for a long time, the marginal probability over one of the images, so I run this process, and then I just look at what I got at the end, the probability distribution over where I end up, the probability over this image, should be close to the target model that I'm interested in. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, and there's a consistency condition that we're going to have to satisfy if we have any hope of um, having an algorithm with this flavor. So we want all of the images after a long time to each look as if they come from the model. So let's say I've run this process for a long time and I get this image in the top right. If that image marginally, if the distribution of that image is the model that I care about, then if I take one more step of my Markov chain Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, I don't want to wander off crazy. I want that next image also to be a good model from my, a uh, good image from my model. So mathematically, the condition is if you draw a sample x, you take one step to x prime, then averaged over what that original image was, the distribution over the next image should be your target distribution p. Okay. And this is, the, this is really the main equation of all of MCMC. Your methods have to satisfy this condition. Um, and more, that's, you don't have to do much more than this, it turns out. There is a trivial way of satisfying this condition, um, and that's if this thing t is the do-nothing operator. So if Marco Aurelio works really hard to generate a sample from his model, and he gives it to me, I could move that around and try and get a different image. But I could just copy it and give it back to him and say, here's a sample from your model. And that's true. It's just not very useful. I haven't, I haven't done anything extra. I haven't told him anything he didn't know. So if this is the identity where x prime is equal to x, then this equation is satisfied. But you need transition operators that do actually change the images and have some hope of exploring the whole image space. And I don't want to get too mathematical, so I'll just loosely say that roughly that's all you need. As long as your transition operators do move around a bit and can explore the whole image space eventually, and you satisfy this one equation, then you do satisfy this, this goal that I've been talking about. You've got a process that you can simulate. And when you pluck an image off the end of it, it will roughly be from your, your distribution. OK, so I've got a little cartoon um, that I could talk about. So it's very hard to sketch realistic cartoons of high dimensional spaces. And however you do it, it's going to be slightly wrong. Um, but this is my version, which is trying to capture the fact that in high dimensions, things look kind of spiky. 
there are many different dimensions you can wander off into and find corners of your model. Um, so I've drawn something spiky in 2D. Um, and I could start my Markov chain somewhere, run along processes as a process that can hop over the gaps in my density, and I'll end up somewhere, this red blob. My hope is that this red blob is a sample from my, my distribution. Now, if this process were kind of long as I've drawn it, and I showed you just this red blob, it would, you wouldn't be able to say that I started here if you didn't see this trace, right? If you did a little inference problem and say, where did I start this Markov chain, and I told you that I'd run it for a few hundred steps, you wouldn't know where I'd come from. And, and that's the intuition behind where the proofs that this method are valid uh, come from. That if you started at an image drawn from the model, then because of this consistency condition, the final position would also be drawn from the model. But as it looks as if it doesn't matter where you start from because you forget where you start from, then you can actually initialize these Markov chains arbitrarily as long as you run them for long enough. There's one other intuition I want to pull out from this one figure. So I started at this point in the top middle of the diagram, and I used some random numbers to simulate this process and ended up here. If I started here again but used a different random seed and I used different random numbers, I would wander around and I would end up somewhere else. Like, you know, I'd plausibly end up down here or maybe over here, right? And as long as this process is long enough, I would, the distribution over where I end up would be uniform over the support of this distribution. It would be from my target distribution. So I'm claiming that in this cartoon, this Markov chain that I'm drawing is long enough to pretty closely draw a sample from my target distribution. And what I want you to notice is what I haven't done. When I simulated this process, I haven't wandered down to the end and back of every single little frond of this distribution. I haven't gone over the entire support of the distribution or visited every mode. And there's this common misconception that there's no way that you can possibly sample from a distribution unless you've had time to visit all the modes. And that's not true at all. You needed there to be some possibility that with some random numbers you would visit some mode. So I didn't visit this mode down here, but you can imagine on another walk of this length I might have done. Um, if I really had to enumerate the whole state space in the one walk that I chose to do, then there'd be no point doing Monte Carlo. If you could enumerate the whole state space, then you could just solve the integrals directly. So this is just one important point that um, you are not going to visit every point in your model when you do MCMC, um, which is fortunate because if you have something like a Boltzmann machine, there's no way you're going to do that. OK, so the big picture again is that we, we can initialize arbitrarily. We run some uh, random walk after the first 100 steps. I've stopped showing the actual trajectory, and I've just used blue dots to show where the Markov chain visited. And those points we're going to use as samples from the distribution. Um, those points are dependent. They're strongly correlated, for sure, because they're all like, adjacent ones in the time series right next to each other. But it turns out that doesn't matter in terms of Monte Carlo. You can throw all of these samples without having to thin them out into the standard Monte Carlo estimator of an integral, and that's a valid thing to do. Your estimator will be consistent and tend to the right answer. Um, it can be hard to compute what the error bars can, should be without understanding the dependency of the chain. But uh, even though these samples are dependent, you can use them in simple Monte Carlo. So uh, this, again, stop me if the big picture isn't clear. But the question now is, where do we get these t distributions from? So uh, this is what we want to happen. What's the algorithm we can write down that actually satisfies these properties? And the one that you'll have definitely seen in the last couple of weeks is Gibbs sampling. Um, so this is the one where you've got this high dimensional object. You go to one of the variables. Um, and you can go to the variables in order, or you can randomly pick them. It's valid either way. Um, I would scan through them systematically, and that will work better. Um, and then you get that variable and you resample it. So in an image, you get one of the pixels, you chuck away the value, and then you resample that to a plausible pixel given the neighborhood. Um, or in a continuous value problem, you um, update along one of the axes at a time, and you resample from the conditional distributions along those directions. OK, so that defines a transition operator t. There's a delta function saying that almost all the components stay the same. And then there's this conditional probability of the one component changing to whatever it changed to. 
Um, so you could do a bunch of maths to try and show that that um, distribution T satisfies the properties I've said. But Gibbs sampling is kind of obviously <coughs> correct. So let's uh, spin a story to see why Gibbs sampling works. So if you get we're doing MCMC for a minute and just imagine that I want to sample from a distribution P of X. For any distribution P of X, I can split it into a product, this is the product rule, and I can split into the marginal of all but one of the components and then the conditional of the remaining component given that choice. And this factorization implies that a way of simulating from this distribution is to first draw from this distribution, draw all but one of the pixels somehow. Then once we've done that difficult feat, we've only got one pixel left to draw which we can draw from its conditional distribution and that bit's easy. So, if we can do that, um, we're set, we've got a valid sample. The question is how do we implement this difficult step of getting all but one of the pixels? So I'm going to draw the image with one pixel missing by asking Marc Aurelio to very generously sample an entire image for me, and then I'm gonna throw away the pixel I don't want. So we've already discussed that marginalization in Monte Carlo is trivial, you just throw away what you don't want. Um, so if I have an oracle that can give me a whole image, I can use that to get a sample from this marginal, and then I can draw the pixel I myself. So now what we've seen is that if Mark Aurelio gives me an image from the distribution, I can come up with a slightly different image, which is clearly also from the distribution. And those images are clearly very dependent on each other, all but one of the pixels are exactly the same. Um, but now you could use this process that I've used to generate an image, and I could give that image to someone else, and they could do this, but with a different pixel J, and they'd get a third image that's slightly different, but it would also come from the right distribution. So no complicated maths required to prove Gibbs sampling is right. Okay, so I do want to do a little bit of math now to give some intuition into what other Markov chain Monte Carlo al algorithms we could possibly imagine. So Gibbs sampling is a very popular one, it's sort of um, very natural, but what other algorithms are there? So in order to do that, I'm just gonna play around a bit with the maths of the Markov chains and uh, see what we can prove is definitely necessary and sufficient for these things to work. So I want us to imagine playing a little inference game. I'm going to draw an image and then from P, and then I'm going to get that image and take one step of Markov chain Monte Carlo and generate a new image, X prime. So I'm gonna give you X prime and not tell you what image I started with X. And I'm gonna ask you to think about what image I might have started with. So you've got this image which is one step, Markov chain step away from the one I started with, and you've gotta try and guess what I started with. So the way, the way to like express your beliefs is to use Bayes rule. You can say, my beliefs are about what image you started with um, given the image that you've just shown me is proportional to my prior beliefs about images and the likelihood model, the, I know that this is the corruption process you use for the image. So this is Bayes rule, this is a conditional belief about where you came from given where you are now and you normalize probabilities in Bayes rule um, by just summing over the variable you're interested in and this sum here is the stationary condition so we know what that sum is. Okay. So this little construction I can clearly always do for any valid transition operator, um, which means that this condition has to hold for some distribution R. And I can make it symmetric by multiplying both sides by this probability. So the symmetric version is on the bottom. So this balance condition I've written down has to hold for every pair of images for some distribution R if you're claiming that your um, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm T is valid. Um, so this is too, too many equations for my liking, so let's draw a picture. Um, what we're saying is, if you simulate a very long Markov chain using your Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, and you pluck out a pair of states at random, and look at the joint probability of generating the first state and then transitioning here, then there is some reverse process R that with the same probability would generate exactly the same sequence in the opposite order and if you pluck out a random pair from that sequence, you would see it with the same probability. So this thing has to be true for your algorithm. You can't come up with a Monte Carlo algorithm that doesn't have this property. So it's always possible if you're running a Markov chain to imagine undoing it and stepping backwards. So a very common idea when people first see Monte Carlo is that they 
they want to come up with really clever moves and maybe use optimizers where they, they say, oh, well, I understand how to like, come up with really good images in MRF, so I'm going to run an optimizer to like, move to a good image. Um, but it's often very hard to undo the effect of that. If you've um, gone from some rubbishy image and you've used a sophisticated optimizer to go right to the mode of the distribution, you sort of forget where you've come from, and you can't plausibly imagine a process R that would take you back. And then there's no way you'll ever be able to prove that the algorithm is valid. So this idea of reversibility is um, very core to MCMC. And in fact, this condition is um, not just a necessary condition, but if you can show that for all pairs of images that this condition holds, it's um, sufficient to prove the stationary condition. If I just sum this equation on both sides over x, then out drops the one condition I actually need on, on the bottom of the slide. OK. So um, fortunately, there's a very generic way of coming up with new algorithms that do satisfy um, a version of this balance condition. If R is actually equal to T, this condition is called detail balance, which most of you will have heard of. Detail balance isn't a necessary condition, but it's a convenient one that the process is its own inverse. Um, so the algorithm, again, that most of you have heard of that um, satisfies detail balance is Metropolis Hastings. Here you start with an arbitrary mutation process, an arbitrary way of mutating or corrupting an image X into a new image X prime by maybe moving a few of the pixels or doing something cleverer. And that Q, that proposal, won't satisfy detail balance. So if you were to simulate a Markov chain using Q, it might wander off to infinity. It might not do something useful. Um, and what Metropolis Hastings does is just reject some of those steps. It stops some of those moves from happening. And that's enough to make the process satisfy detail balance and sample from the correct distribution. So the cartoon here is the green walk is our Markov chain, our Metropolis Hastings Markov chain. And um, at each point, Q is just a Gaussian distribution centered on the current point. So it tries to do a Gaussian diffusion. And the red little offshoots are places that this um, Q distribution tried to go to. And the Metropolis Hastings algorithm said, no, don't go there. That doesn't look good. And so it stayed where it was for a step of the Markov chain. And then it carried on moving. And so the transition operator under Markov chain, under Metropolis Hastings, the probability of going from an image x to a new image x prime is the probability of proposing that particular move multiplied by the probability of accepting the rule. So this min 1 ratio is the core bit of this algorithm. It's the probability that you accept the move. So if the new image looks good, if it has high probability, you're more likely to accept the move. But if this is the sort of proposal you make all the time, then maybe you should downweight making this move. Um, this is the probability. This is a transition operator if the images are different. The images are the same. The expression is more complicated. But it doesn't matter. Staying in the same place is always a valid Markov chain Monte Carlo operator, so you don't have to worry about it. OK, so I've got just in the slide set, which you can download, more text that goes through this in more detail and uh, proves the detailed balance condition. And I've also put into the slide set complete MATLAB code so that you can uh, read through that for yourself, but I'm not going to go through it line by line. What I want to show you is the results of running this code. So this you can apply to any distribution. I'm going to apply it to just a unit Gaussian distribution. So I've passed the code a function handle saying this is my energy. It's a unit Gaussian distribution. And then I'm plotting against time or iteration number uh, where the Markov chain goes. And this Metropolis algorithm has a choice of what the Q is, what I'm going to use to perturb the distribution. And uh, I can set the width of that proposal, or I can set a step size. So if I set the step size to 1, which is the same width as the distribution, I make pretty rapid progress. Um, and if I were to crush this time series into a histogram and look at it, I'd get a nice bell curve. I'd be sampling from the distribution. I am rejecting a bunch of the moves. So I rejected about a third of the moves. And that's because my Q isn't the same as the target distribution. If I was sampling from the target distribution, I'd be sampling a unit Gaussian centered at the origin. I'm sampling from a unit Gaussian centered at where I currently am in my Markov chain, which means I'm sampling from the wrong distribution and I reject some of the moves. If I were to propose from a much wider distribution, so my Q now has a width of 100, that's what this bottom plot shows, 
um, then most of my proposals would just be in crazy places. And the algorithm is still valid. It will eventually give me the right answer, but most of the moves are getting rejected because it doesn't want me to wander off to infinity. And so in this time series of 100 steps, I only move five times. And so although this algorithm is valid, it clearly is working less well than this one. Um, if I plot a histogram of these locations, I'm not going to get a nice bell curve. So if rejections are bad, and I got more rejections when I set a really wide width to my proposal, it's tempting to say, well, I should just set a really narrow perturbation. If I don't move my current state very much, then I'm not going to mess it up, and uh, the moves are more likely to be accepted. So the top plot shows the trajectory if I use a very small step size, and now I'm only rejecting two moves in the entire time series. And that's a disaster. So in rejection sampling, you want to accept all the time. In Markov chain Monte Carlo and Metropolis, the only way that you're seeing the target distribution is by seeing rejections. Otherwise, you're just sampling from an arbitrary stochastic process defined by Q. So this trajectory is almost indistinguishable from just a Brownian diffusion with step size 0.1. So you, you have to have the rejections in the algorithm to actually sample from the distribution you're interested in. Um, and uh, David Mackay's information theory book argues that because the rejections are giving you information from the algorithm, you want to see rejections about half the time to maximize the information. And that argument's slightly dodgy and heuristic. The, the correct answer is, in this situation, the, the optimal acceptance rate is 0.234 something. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this thing is valid for any uh, rejection rate, and if you, you reject at least about half your samples, then the thing is probably working well. Okay, so this is in 1D, and of course we're interested in something from high dimensional distributions. So let's look at what uh, Metropolis does in high dimensions, or two dimensions. Um, so here, P, this long ellipse, is my target distribution. And I don't know which the sensible direction to move in, which is along the length of the ellipse. So I'm just perturbing my current state with a dumb spherical perturbation because I don't have enough handle on the problem to make more intelligent moves. Um, and I can set some width to that spherical distribution. But if I set the width really large, then I'm going to propose off the manifold of the distribution. And so I'll reject a lot. Now, here's another example of uh, low dimensional pictures being misleading. In 2D, actually the right answer is to make the spherical distribution Q large because occasionally you'll make a big hop to the other end of the distribution and that will work well. But in high D, there are many, many directions you can go in off this manifold that will be wrong. And if you set this distribution to be wide, the algorithm won't work at all. So you're constrained to set the width of Q to be towards the narrower dimensions of your target distribution. And um, it, again, if you set the width too small, then you're just going to do a Gaussian diffusion that has nothing to do with the distribution. So if you set it as sort of roughly as I've drawn it, um, you are going to do a slow diffusion in this direction. You have to go a distance L, in steps of width epsilon, and there's this very painful diffusion that by random warp will take a quadratic number of steps in that, in that ratio. So. Um, when you've got strong correlations that you don't understand and you're not able to bake into your proposal mechanism, um, this diffusive behavior of just taking a, a random walk and accepting and rejecting steps um, means things work very slowly. So if this sort of algorithm had been used for big Bayesian neural networks in the 90s, Bayesian neural networks wouldn't have worked. So I'm going to get on to like, the, the fancier versions that actually uh, work for big neural networks in possibly after the break, we'll see. OK, so what's the strategy for MCMC? It looks like we want good proposals. If we don't get our proposals right, then we're setting ourselves up for a very slow walk. And so potentially, you want to be really clever about how you come up with your proposals. You could imagine approximating your distribution using some fancy technology to come up with Q. Um, and there's something really nice about MCMC, which is that you don't have to get lucky and come up with one good approximation. You can combine many transition operators, and the performance of all of them put together is often better than any of them individually. So if I start at some image and I use transition operator A, then where I end up, this thing will be drawn from the right distribution if this one was. If I use a different transition operator from 
that image to get a second image, then this one will also be drawn from the right distribution. And by induction, all of these images that I've drawn, even though I'm using different transition operators each time, will all come from the right distribution as long as those are all valid transition operators. So some of them could suck. Some of them could be the do-nothing operator that just copy, but that doesn't introduce any problems into the algorithm. Whereas if you try and combine important samplers, if one of them has infinite variance, your combination has infinite variance too. So the, the great thing about MCMC is if you've got a whole bunch of different ideas, you can just throw them all into the bag and hopefully one of them will work well for the particular bit of the state space you're in at the moment. Right. So it looks like when, when I f first learned about MCMC, I got a bit depressed because I thought the only thing that would be in MCMC research is coming up with good proposals Q, and that sounded like a fairly boring um, uh, task where I'd have to look at each new model and then come up with approximations and come up with Q and you know the, there would only be one algorithm. Um, so uh, the next bit of the talk, and some of this will have to go after the break, is uh, how we shift the goalposts to make MCMC research a bit more interesting. Um, so it looks like if you want to satisfy detail balance, then Metropolis is basically the only game in town. But what you can do is change which distribution you're sampling from. And that's the idea behind auxiliary variable methods. So um, again, the point of MCMC, what we're trying to do is approximate integrals. So this is the integral I'm interested in. I can rewrite that by introducing some irrelevant variables v and then integrating them out again. And here, x and v can depend on each other in some arbitrary way. But as long as the marginal of their joint distribution is this distribution, then this is an identity. So. Um, Given this equation, it's tempting to just say, well, I can see that v just drops out and is irrelevant, so I should go back to here. The stupid idea in auxiliary variables is to say, no, I'm going to take this equation seriously and draw both x and v, even though I don't need v, throw v away, and then compute my Monte Carlo estimate. So what we're looking for are joint distributions x and v, where for some reason it's easier to draw both x and v than just x. And uh, you've seen some examples of this. So if you've got a restricted Boltzmann machine which has um, visible pixels and hidden units, it's possible to analytically marginalize out all the hiddens. So you could run Markov chain Monte Carlo just on the pixels in image space. And you can do site Gibbs updates, and that works. But most people don't do that. Most people don't integrate out the hiddens. Um, because it's very easy to sample all the vi visible pixels given the hiddens and all of the hiddens given the pixels. And so it's more convenient to define a sampler that way. Um, and there's a nice paper by James Martins and Ilya Sutskova, AI Stats 2010, where they get distributions that weren't RBMs and turn them into RBMs by introducing more variables just so that the sampling is more convenient. Okay. So what I'm going to go through are a couple of examples of places where people have introduced extra variables to make uh, navigation easier. And the, the first of these, the, the, like the, the first real use of this trick was by Swenson and Wong in uh, the late 80s. And uh, this is a, um, an algorithm for easing models for spin systems. So again, I've just drawn it differently, but this is an image of binary pixels or spins. And um, they introduce these extra variables, which are black bonds, which sit on the, uh, on the edges where there are weights in the model. Um, and these bonds are very easy to draw. They're drawn independently. They can only be put down where the colors are the same. So it's not possible to put a bond joining a blue and a red dot. But you don't put bonds down in every place that you possibly could. So there's some rule for doing that. Um, after the bonds have been drawn, you find the connected components. So here's a connected component of all of these blue things are connected, the sum root between them. And for each connected component, the algorithm is able to independently choose whether to recolor it or not. So this um, blue connected component at the top stayed blue in the final image, but this whole red connected component in the bottom left all changed color all at once, and it was able to flip all of those spins together. Um, if we zoom out, uh, there's this very large sea of blue in the top right of the original image, and that's turned into a very large sea of red in the final image. So this is one iteration of the algorithm, makes these massive changes to the image. And the computational cost is similar, slightly more, but similar to sweeping over the pixels once with Gibbs sampling. So it would 
probably take hundreds of iterations of Gibbs sampling to make a move as dramatically as big as this. So Swenson Wong in the 80s was just this amazing new piece of technology that sort of really shook up what was possible to do with eating models. Um, there's code for this on my website, um, but I'll tell you now that it doesn't work at all on images um, modeled with restricted Boltzmann machines. So Boltzmann machines are just eating models, so this algorithm applies, but um, a lot of how well the algorithm actually performs depends on the details of what your weights are. And um, what happens when you have uh, Boltzmann machines applied to images is that um, it forms these connected components and it says, oh, I can either flip all the pixels in this component or leave them as they are. And it forms very large components that given that we're modeling images, it's very unnatural often to get a whole bit of an image and just invert it, so it decides not to. So what happens is when you apply Swenson Wang to uh, real image models, it just doesn't move at all. It becomes the do-nothing operator, which is a valid algorithm and completely useless. Um, so this is a bit, that, I mean, why did I go through this if it's not useful to you guys? It's a bit of a warning to be careful when talking to physicists. Um, they're, they're very clever guys, but they're often interested in completely different systems to what you are. And they might mathematically be the same, um, but in practice they're completely different. Um, Fortunately, there's a, do you mind if I go like three minutes over? Okay, so fortunately there's a bit of technology from physics which is actually um, really useful to us and um, it's been, it was used in Bayesian neural networks in the 90s by Radford Neal, but it's continuing to be useful in energy-based models and beyond. And that's Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, it was originally called hybrid Monte Carlo. So again, it's an auxiliary variable method. We have a joint distribution X, the variables that we actually care about, and V, which are completely irrelevant. We're just sampling them anyway for the fun of it. Um, and this distribution, the Xs and the Vs are actually independent. So there's a product of two terms, one for the Xs and one for the Vs. The original term is the distribution we care about. We put our energy function in here. And this term is just a Gaussian distribution on the Vs. So all we've done is added some extra independent irrelevant variables V, which come from like the most boring distribution on real variables you can think of, a spherical Gaussian. Um, and the sum of the two energies is an energy for the X's and an energy for the V's. It's called the Hamiltonian. Um, and the physical analogy which um, people invoke is that E is like a potential energy. So you've got a ball with position X, which has some gravitational potential energy. Some locations are at the top of hills and some locations are at the bottom of hills. And the ball also has velocity V. Um, and this ball has total energy, gravitational potential energy, plus kinetic energy. And that total energy is the Hamiltonian. Okay, but the physics story doesn't necessarily matter. I'm free to write down this joint distribution. I'm also free to apply any Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm I like to it um, then throw away the Vs and keep the Xs. Okay. So what Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms could I use? Well, Gibbs sampling is one of my favorites. So I could choose to Gibbs sample just velocity components. And the Vs are independent of the Xs, so their conditional distribution is just a Gaussian. So I can just get the velocity of my ball and I can just kick it by resampling it from a, a Gaussian distribution. And then the, the second move is kind of funky. Um, it's a metropolis move. It's a proposal, which you end up accepting or rejecting. Um, but the proposal is deterministic, and it's the result of simulating some physics. So you pretend this is a ball, and you simulate where it would roll. It's a high dimensional ball, um, uh, surface. Um, and that changes both the position and the velocity. So if you start off slowly at the top of a hill, you can roll down to the bottom of the hill and end up really fast. So you change both X and V, trading off kinetic energy and potential energy. But we know in physics that total energy is conserved. So the Hamiltonian will be the same, which means the probability of the final state is equal to the probability of the initial state. So in, under this ideal algorithm, which we can't actually implement, but if we could, um, energy is conserved, probability is conserved, and when you work out the acceptance probability, it's one. So you do the simulation, and then you just keep the state where it ends up. You kick the ball by resampling its velocity, and you simulate again. Now, this, um, the details of exactly why this is all valid and exactly how you would run it are a bit involved. And I think I could probably give a half-hour talk just on that. Um, 
But if you're going to go away and read about this, there's, something, there's one part of it which often seems very mysterious. Um, you see these discussions that say that Hamiltonian dynamics maintain phase space volume. And it's often not very clear like, what they're talking about and why they care. So I want to go through one toy example that explains why you have to be a bit careful when you do this sort of update. Okay, So this is uh, simpler than Hamiltonian dynamics. I've just got a real valued variable that takes on values between 0 and 10. And the dash at 1 is just for my purposes, because I'm interested in these two segments. But I've just got a real number between 0 and 10. And I've decided that the segment on the right between 1 and 10 is interesting, and the segment between 0 and 1 is interesting. So I'm going to be clever and come up with a proposal that will take me between those two regions. So the rule is that this is a deterministic proposal. If I'm currently at position x in the first part of the sequence, I add 1 to my value, and then, sorry, I multiply by 9, and then I add 1 to my value. So if I start out here at 0.5, this update rule will take me to 5.5. .5. The second part of the rule is I apply if I'm between 1 and 10. So if I were at 5.5, .5, I would subtract 1, divide by 9, and I'd end up back at 0.5. So this rule is reversible. Um, if you start out at one point and you apply this rule repeatedly, you can only bounce back and forth between two points. So you'd have to combine this with other Markov chain Monte Carlo operators to explore the whole space. Um, and, uh, but it's a proposal we could use in Metropolis uh, amongst other proposals. And here's an argument of how we, how we do it. Here's the Metropolis Hastings acceptance rule in the bottom left. We'd evaluate the probabilities of the stationary distribution. And what are the cues? Well, that's proposal probabilities. So the wrong thing to say is, well, I started out at 0.5, and I'm proposing moving to 5.5. I always do that. So that has probability 1. And if I were at 5.5, I would have probability 1 of going back to 0.5. These cues would cancel, and I would end up with this acceptance rule. Okay. Now, this acceptance rule is clearly wrong, um, because let's imagine that we had a uniform distribution here between 0 and 10. Then if I drew a sample perfectly from this distribution, 0.9 of the time I would be between 1 and 10. I apply this rule once, and all of those points would move to the first segment. So after one step of this algorithm, 0.9 of the probability mass is between 0 and 1, and yet only 0.1 of the mass should be here if my target distribution is uniform. Okay. So, this algorithm is wrong, and as it's just after 10, I'll leave it there, and you can figure out why in the break if you haven't already seen it, and uh, we'll reconvene. Thanks.